general, a per unit subsidy of a particular amount behaves in exactly the opposite way as a per unit tax of an equivalent amount. So let's go through in the same way that we do for taxes and think about how we can find the market equilibrium when a subsidy is present. Like with a tax, a subsidy results in a situation where the price that the consumer pays at the end of the day is not the same as the price that the producer gets to keep for an item. Unlike a tax, however, when a subsidy is in place, the price that the producer gets to keep for the item is actually higher than the consumer's price out of pocket, rather than lower, as we saw with a tax. So let's think about what that means algebraically. So we can actually say that the price that the producer receives under a subsidy is equal to the price that the consumer pays out of pocket plus the amount of the subsidy. And intuitively you can think of this as the producer gets a certain amount of money from the consumer and then has a certain amount of money from the government kicked their way as well for every unit that is produced and consumed in this market. Equivalently, we can do some simple algebra, and we could say that it must be the case that the price of the consumer is equal to what the producer gets to keep minus the amount of the subsidy. And we could frame this as the consumer paying out of pocket the producer's price for this item, but then getting a rebate from the government equivalent to the amount of the subsidy. We can take this relationship between the price to the consumer and the price to the producer and add in our typical equilibrium condition to pretty easily find the market equilibrium when we have a subsidy. So our regular equilibrium condition is just that we have economic equilibrium when the quantity supplied in the market is equal to the quantity demanded in that market. So we can go through, we can either do this algebraically if we had equations for supply and demand curves, or we can do this graphically by just drawing a supply and demand diagram. And again, we have quantity on the horizontal axis, price on the vertical axis, and we can just draw a typical upward sloping supply curve and a typical downward sloping demand curve. And now we want to look for a place where these relationships, they're just two forms of the same relationship, so it doesn't really matter which one you think about, but where these relationships hold. And notice that the price to the producer is given by the supply curve, and the price to the consumer is given by the demand curve. Sometimes these are referred to as the supply price and the demand price for that exact reason. So we can look here, we can say, well, in this region here, to the left of the intersection, this is all the places where the consumer's price, which is given by the demand curve, is larger than the producer's price. So you say, oh, that's, that's not what we're looking for here. So we know that we have to be looking for our equilibrium somewhere in the region here. So we can look to the right of this point of intersection, and we can say, okay, we need a particular quantity where the price to the consumer and the price to the producer are separated by exactly the amount of this subsidy. So let's say the subsidy was about you know, yay big, we would just say, oh, well, that's going to be here on our diagram. And you could just label this. You could say, here's the amount of our subsidy. And notice that when we have a supply curve that's always upward sloping and a demand curve that's always downward sloping, there's only going to be one place where the wedge between the two prices is exactly the amount of the subsidy. So we can conclude that this must be our market equilibrium quantity with the subsidy. I'll just pull this down here, and I'll call this Q star sub S. And then we could just locate our prices as well by just looking at the corresponding prices on our supply curve and our, de and our demand curve. So of course our supply curve here is going to give the price that the producer gets to keep and the demand curve here, this quantity, is going to give the price that the consumer pays out of pocket. And not surprisingly, we can see that those two prices, as we stated, differ by exactly the amount of the subsidy.
we can note a few things about the market impact of a subsidy and show how, in fact, a subsidy does have the opposite market impact to an equivalent tax. So the first thing that we notice, and notice what I've done here is I've labeled the original equilibrium price and quantity that I just called the original free market equilibrium quantity Q star and the original free market equilibrium price P star. And we notice that almost by definition, the quantity transacted with the subsidy is greater than the original free market equilibrium quantity. And we said when we had a tax, the taxes discourage production and consumption. So we saw when we had a tax, our equilibrium quantity was somewhere to the left of the original free market equilibrium quantity. So we do get the opposite impact there. We also get to some degree the desired impact of a subsidy. That subsidies are usually provided to, from the government to encourage production and consumption. And we can see here that at least on that level, that is what is actually happening. The other thing that we notice is that the, not the burden, we talked about a tax burden is shared between consumers and producers, but here we sort of have a subsidy benefit. And that subsidy benefit is also shared between consumers and producers. But now, rather than having the producer get a lower price for their output than they got before, as we had with a tax, under the subsidy, the producer is actually getting a higher price inclusive of the subsidy than he did before. Instead of the consumer paying a higher price than in a free market, as happens with the tax, the consumer is actually paying a lower price out of pocket than he or she was in the free market. So again, we have that reversal. That said, a subsidy is similar to a tax in that the producer and the consumer share the impact, or in this case, share the benefits, rather than the benefit only accruing to one party or the other. And that's going to be true regardless of whether the subsidy is given directly to producers or directly to consumers. And you'll note that the way we drew this, it looks like the benefits are evenly shared between producers and consumers, but this need not be the case. And again, like with the tax, the benefits of the subsidy and whether they go mostly to producers or mostly to consumers depends on the relative elasticity of demand and elasticity of supply.